Hello and welcome to Volusia Magazine. I'm Amber Osman. In this week's episode, we have details on beach ramp closures. Volusia residents cleaned our beaches. And some unfortunate young turtles got an unexpected return trip. Plus, Joanne Magley talks with Jay Cassens, Director of Business Development at the Daytona Beach International Airport. Those segments and more coming right up on Volusia Magazine. I hope you stay tuned. While we enjoy a near endless summer here in Volusia County, Labor Day marks the official end of summer across the country. With the reduction of tourists to the area, Volusia County's Coastal Division has initiated its off-season vehicle beach access ramp schedule. Thirteen vehicle access ramps are open year-round, seven days a week, while three ramps are open only on weekends. Those ramps are Millsap Road, Amelia Avenue and Crawford Road. Five ramps, Williams Avenue, University Boulevard, Minerva Road, Van Avenue and El Portal Street will be closed until March of 2017. Jessica Winterwerp, Volusia County's Coastal Director, explains that as the season winds down, fewer tourists and residents frequent the beaches, leaving some vehicle access ramps nearly vacant. Well, typically after Labor Day, our tourist season is declining as the children are back in school and people are gearing up for fall activities. Um, and in order to reduce our operating expenses, we analyze what our highest usage ramps are throughout the year. And we use historical data from last year to determine which ramps are our least um, producing. We take our lowest usage ramps in the, the off season, starting the Tuesday after Labor Day, and we reduce, we close them up so we can save costs. We're looking at about $180,000 worth of cost savings to the county's general fund. While some ramps are closed to vehicles, access is always open for pedestrians and bicyclists. For a complete listing of beach access ramps, you can visit volusia.org beach and click on the beach driving and parking tab. More than 2,000 volunteers put on their old clothes and water shoes to remove more than 7,000 pounds of trash from the county's beaches, rivers, and parks on a recent Saturday afternoon. It's part of the annual International Coastal Cleanup and Halifax Indian River Cleanup. The most common items found were cigarette butts, followed by food wrappers and plastic bottle caps. The county's Environmental Management Division coordinated the massive effort, which had a significant local impact. Becky O'Keefe, who coordinated the county's efforts, was one of the 141 volunteers at Ormond Beach's Andy Romano Park. We have groups that come over and do it year after year, and they, this is something they love doing every year. And the more people that come out, the more people we see getting more involved, seeing how much trash is out there, and caring more about it. So I think it'll make them think twice before they throw something on the ground. Along the beach, we actually have blue trash cans and yellow recycle bins. So I'd ask people if they could deposit their trash in the blue trash cans and their recycling in the yellow recycling bins. And that will take care of some of the problems. Um, also, when you're away from the beach, um, don't litter. When you litter, it can get into our storm drains and that can end up in our waterways as well. Trash in waterways is more than an eyesore. It's one of the most serious pollution problems of our time, affecting the health of people, wildlife, and economies. For example, trash in waterways injures swimmers and harms wildlife that eats it or gets trapped in its mess. It also can undermine tourism and economic activity. Volusia County residents can act locally by stopping this trash at its source before it has the chance to entangle dolphins or endanger sea turtles. They can dispose of trash properly and take part in cleanup efforts. It's just that easy. The county's next cleanup will be in April when volunteers will tackle the St. John's River. But you can feel free to pick up trash anytime, any place. The Volusia County Library System has more than just books. Here's a look at upcoming programs at our branches. For 
more library events, visit volusialibrary.org. They said I couldn't dream. Called me a piece of trash and swore that's all I'd ever be. Said a bottle couldn't see the ocean. Give up. Go back to the dumpster. But I didn't listen. I made my way. And now, I am what I've always wanted to be. Department of Health officials were on hand in Orange City to open a consolidated health facility to serve West Volusia residents. Holly Smith has this report in this week's Community Health Matters. Nearly 10 years after a tornado destroyed the Department of Health's clinic in DeLand, officials cut the ribbon on a new consolidated facility in Orange City. It's a more convenient option for West Volusia residents. Department of Health and Volusia County Administrator Patricia Boswell. It's really important for people to have access to the types of um, services um, that we provide in the County Health Department. It's very difficult for people that may not have uh, regular, reliable transportation to get to one site um, as we now have in Daytona. So basically, um, having this location on the west side is going to make accessing services for people that live on the west side of Volusia County much, much easier. The new office serves Orange City, Deltona, DeBerry, and DeLand. It's also near other health care providers and Votran's hub of public transportation routes serving those cities. Services available at the Orange City location include child and adult immunizations, travel immunizations, family planning, pregnancy testing, and testing and treatment for sexually transmitted diseases. Dental care also is available. When a tornado destroyed the Department of Health's location in DeLand, all of those services for patients were dispersed to locations in DeLand and Deltona. Well, now that all those services are back in one place, right here in Orange City, it's more convenient for patients and also it's a more efficient service delivery model. Convenience, it's important for people when it comes to access to health services. Boswell is working to make it easier for people to access health department services. Because these types of services um, help to ensure that uh, Babies, pregnant women, families with small children have um, access to good nutrition, um, breastfeeding support. We also do a lot of disease control activities when it comes to STD treatment, testing, um, and also HIV testing. And when it comes to um, making sure that there's no unwanted pregnancies, um, reliable birth control methods for individuals who don't have access and um, to other sources of um, health care. The Department of Health also has clinic locations in Daytona Beach and New Smyrna Beach. A list of locations and services is online at volusiahealth.com forward slash locations. For the Florida Department of Health in Volusia County, I'm Dr. Holly Smith. The recent tropical storms have affected this year's sea turtles hatching along our coast. More than 300 hatchling and washback sea turtles are being cared for at the Marine Science Center after being washed ashore due to the recent rough surf. Washbacks are newly hatched turtles that have made it out to sea for some length of time but are being washed back to shore in a line of seaweed during or after a storm. Washbacks are typically found during the later part of the sea turtle season between August and November. The turtles have been rescued from Volusia, Flagler, St. John's, and Duval counties, and even some as far away as coastal Georgia, with the large majority coming from Volusia County. 
So here in Volusia County, you may see, you know, a bunch of seaweed up along the beach. During that time, we're going to survey. It's what we call our washback season. Uh, this time of year, whenever we see fresh seaweed on the beach, we've got volunteer groups and our beach safety officers that are out there surveying any of that fresh seaweed looking for these little baby turtles that have made it, unfortunately, back to shore and need, need some medical attention. When the rescued washback sea turtles arrive at the Marine Science Center, employees weigh and measure them, evaluate their overall well-being, provide food, and if needed, administer fluids. The really important part about these washback turtles is that they're the ones that have survived that, you know, one in a thousand that have statistically made it all the way offshore, made it to the weed line, and were thriving out there for at least some length of time before the storms might have washed them back in. So those are the turtles that really have a great chance of surviving. If we can get to them, get them the medical attention that they need, make sure they are eating and getting strong, those turtles really have a good significant chance of, of survival. The rescued sea turtles will be released back into the ocean in the Sargassum weed line at the western edge of the Gulf Stream about 45 miles offshore. If you see a nesting adult sea turtle or hatchlings making their way to the ocean, admire them from a distance. If a turtle appears to be in immediate danger, notify a lifeguard or a beach safety officer or you can call the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission at 888-404-3922. For information about Volusia County's Sea Turtle Program, you can call 386-238-4668 or you can visit VolusiaSeaTurtles.org. The Marine Science Center is open to the public at 100 Lighthouse Drive, Ponce Inlet. Visitors may view the Turtle Hospital and walk through a marine display area and Seabird Rehabilitation Center from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Tuesday through Saturday and noon to 4 p.m. on Sundays. For information, you can visit marinesciencecenter.com or you can call 386-304-5545. This week on Solutions for Your Life, Laura Cash, Volusia County UF IFAS 4-H Extension Agent, shares a sewing project completed at 4-H Camp at the Agricultural Center. My name is Laura Cash and this is Solutions for Your Life. Today in 4-H we have sewing class. The youth are sewing what are called origami purses and I have a couple samples for you right here. It's the way that it's folded and we're going to add a drawstring at the top so it's a purse. So there's one with my friend Bethany and right here is Xander with his in a different fabric. You want to show it to him Xander? Sewing is such an important skill to learn, a life skill. It teaches the youth independence. It teaches them how to take their time and to focus and to be good shoppers. And it's a great thing to do in 4-H. And we do this year round. Fold it in big triangle. Everybody got a big triangle? Oh, no. You got a big triangle. Yeah, that's wonderful. Now fold it, fold it in big triangle. Big triangle. Yes, just like that. Big triangle. 4-H is an international program, and the 4-H's stand for head, heart, hands, and health. So we focus on those areas with our educational programs. It's a youth-adult partnership, and are open to ages 5 to 18. I, I like the fact that they um, that they offer sewing because. It's really, really fun because I can just, I can do whatever I want. Well, I can't really do whatever I want. But um, in sewing, they teach you how to sew. So at yesterday, I, I did this, but um, it came out wrong, so then Miss Cash helped me. You go all the way back to Miss Cash. She's right there, but she's head right there. And so, yeah, and it's really, really fun. All the way up, yeah, all the way up. Just like that, okay? And then, with your pressure foot. Is this, is this the way it's supposed to be? Yeah. So, do you see how I did that side? We were working on corsages, and we did canning, and we're doing sewing. So you got it matched up, just like a perfect triangle, okay? Yeah, exactly, it's a trapezoid. 
Alright, now, see where this edge is? Come over just a smidge and so straight down. And then, not at the corner, but just a little bit past it. And so straight down. All of these skills are important in life for home economics, financial education, as well as the basic skills of cooking and sewing, as well as common courtesy. Keep it straight. Keep going. You did great. Keep going straight down. Very good. Look at you go. It's just not all the way through. Like it has to come up here. It has to come up here and down. So I'm going to get back to it to get this project finished up. I'm Laura Cash with Solutions for Your Life. Here's a look at some events happening around Volusia County. For more events and county news, visit volusia.org. It's time to go into the studio and join the Director of Community Information, Joanne Magley, and her guest, the Director of Business Development at Daytona Beach International Airport, Jay Cassens. Thanks, Amber. Well, the county-run Daytona Beach International Airport is a major economic development asset for all of Volusia County, not only because of the passenger traffic in and out, but because of the businesses that lease space on airport property. So joining us today is Jay Cassens, Director of Business Development for Daytona Beach International Airport. Hi, Jay. Hi. Thanks for being here. Thank you. So the county-run airport continues to experience growth month after month, and August was really a good month for the airport. So tell us about it. Yes, well, uh, this marks our 10th consecutive month of uh, passenger increases year over year. Uh, this particular month, we were up almost 16% over last August, and for the year, we're up about 9% uh, the last the rolling 12 months. Um, so we're experiencing increases like we haven't seen in several years. Um, actually, August, if you compare August 2016 to August 2010, we're up almost 50%, so things are going well right now. And Jay, part of the reason is because of the new JetBlue service, which we didn't have last year, but also they're bringing in bigger planes. Yes, um, you know, a big part of it is obviously JetBlue. They had their highest load factor um, since they started in January, which was 86% in August. And that's the percentage of the aircraft that are filled with passengers. So that's a very positive trend going forward. Um, we've also seen Delta and American really provide uh, steady increases over the last couple years. Um, really what they're probably going to do in the next year or so is just increase by a couple percentage points as far as the capacity that's offered to Daytona. And I'm sure with other airlines as well, when they see the success of this, of this new airline, it kind of keeps the other airlines paying close attention. Yeah, I think uh, the other airlines are really paying attention to what JetBlue has done. I think they're going to use this as a gauge to see really if we can grow the market. And actually, the New York market, since, JF, or since uh, JetBlue started at JFK, um, that's grown by over 400%. So wow. we've really um, you know, grown the market, but also recaptured some of the passengers that maybe were looking for direct service from other airports in the area, like Jacksonville and Orlando. So typically, airline traffic declines in the fall, uh, but we want to keep the positive momentum going. So we're continuing a marketing push specifically for JetBlue, and that includes billboards that people might see in the Seminole County area, and it includes digital ads. Why is it so important to attract, um, let's say, the people in Seminole County? Well, you know, like you mentioned, um, the fall travel season, air travel season, is probably the slowest um, season of the year for air travel. And, you know, really it's because kids are going back to school, mm -hmm. there's no holidays. Um, so you've got really a slow period. And we want to make sure that we don't um, lose any of the gains that we made in the springtime and summer with, say, for instance, JetBlue. Um, we want to 
continue to make sure that their revenue is up, that the planes are full. So we're really making mar a marketing push uh, going forward in the fall and specifically focusing on the Seminole County area because I think those folks there, there's a lot of businesses. It's a very um, up and coming area and they really have kind of a decision to make whether to drive down to Orlando International Airport or possibly come to Daytona Beach. So we're trying to capture some of those business travelers um, that have a choice in air travel. And really, we're trying to get them the message that Daytona Beach International Airport is convenient, it's friendly, and it's stress-free, and they might not necessarily experience that if they if they keep going. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, they go to a larger airport, you know, they're going to be uh, spending a lot of time parking and getting, you know, waiting a ticket uh, line to get their tickets and waiting in the TSA checkpoint. So, or they could come to Daytona and spend, you know, 30 minutes at the most doing all of that. Let's talk a little bit more about recruiting new airlines and new air service because it really takes uh, a while for an airline to decide if it makes sense for them to add either a new service or additional service. What are the airlines looking for when, when they make those decisions? Like what are the factors that are important to the airlines? Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, starting out first, it really takes years and years to develop air service. It's just, it's meeting after meeting after meeting and building that relationship and moving up higher and higher on their list. Um, they really wanna get to know that the, that the community and the airport is behind the air service. So it's not just the airline is serving the airport, but they're really serving the community. So making sure and really understanding the community, that the community is going to fill those aircraft is very important for the airline. Um, so they're looking at, you know, what are the driving factors to bring air service to an area? You know, are there tourist attractions that are highly desirable? Are there businesses? Uh, a, a big part of the airline and their revenue is attracting the business customer. The business customer usually will spend more money on air service and they're not necessarily price sensitive. So. Uh, understanding the business and is business growing in the area, what tourist attractions do you have available, um, so they can ensure that when they make a decision that they're going to fill those aircraft. I mean, you know, I often get calls from people that say, you know, when are you going to start flying to, you know, the hometown where my parents live? Right. Well, that's only, you know, a couple people a year. We've got to make sure that this is long and sustainable and they're not going to lose money because this is a multi-million dollar decision for an airline. We also do a thing called a leakage study and we see passengers that live in the Volusia County area but are going to other airports. So we pull credit card data and zip codes on passengers that live in say DeLand and that drive down to Orlando to go to Chicago. And then we can determine that, well, if we have direct nonstop service, we can recapture those passengers. All right, let's talk now about the financial picture because the airport does not use ad valorem taxes. You're actually an enterprise fund. Uh, so explain what an enterprise fund is and th the various elements of business around on the airport property that, that help with the revenue stream. So as you mentioned, um, we don't collect any ad valorem tax dollars for the operation of the airport. It's operated as an enterprise, as a business. It's self-sustaining. We have to be self-sustainable. Um, according to the FAA and right now our annual revenue is about 16 million dollars a year and about 67 percent of that comes from airline revenues directly okay. the rest comes from our tenants that lease land from us around the airport so it's both important that we diversify our revenue by developing some of our land we have 365 acres that are available that we can develop and uh, bring in you know, aviation enterprises to lease that land and help balance out that revenue portfolio that we have. But it's also important to attract uh, new airlines because every passenger spends money, whether it's at the rental car counters or through the airlines, um, you know, buying food at the concessions and gift shop. Every passenger that comes through, it's worth about $22 for us, um, you know, every year. So it's very important that we continue to increase air service, but yet expand and diversify our portfolio on the on the land development side. Okay, let's go back into the airport now. We, TSA Pre-Check Enrollment Center began at your airport in July 1st, I believe, of this year. Why is it so important, um, I guess, to have this enrollment center right here at our airport? 
Well, I think uh, recently there's been a lot of attention played to uh, TSA checkpoints around the country, at the larger facilities at least. Um, so when passengers are traveling, you know, out of Daytona to JFK or Atlanta and they're coming home and, you know, instead of having to deal with 35 or 45 minute wait times, they can use TSA PreCheck and, you know, it only takes five or 10 minutes to get through. So having an enrollment center at Daytona Beach International Airport is so convenient. I think we already know how convenient it is for air service, but to go to an enrollment center, usually you would have to go to a larger airport and pay for parking and deal with all the traffic down there or up there, depending on which airport mm -hmm. you're talking about. But um, here at, at Daytona, you know, you just walk right in the door. It takes five minutes um, to get your enrollment done and you'll be done with the process in 15 minutes, as long as you make an appointment. It's been so popular here in Daytona that if you're not making an appointment and you just try to walk in, it could be up to an hour wait. Oh, wow. So how can people find more, find out more information about either Daytona Beach International Airport, possibly maybe a business um, opportunity at the airport or, or anything else? Uh, pretty much all of our information is available on flydaytonafirst.com and our Facebook page. We have a lot of information about um, air service, things that are going on in the aviation industry, things that are going on at the airport, um, promotional contests that we're running. Everything's, we try to keep uh, up to date on our Facebook page and everything's right on there and everything else is on flydaytonafirst.com. All right. Well, Jay Cassens, Director of Business Development for Daytona Beach International Airport, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Joanne. Amber, back to you. Thanks, Joanne, and thank you for watching Volusia Magazine. If you have any questions about the show, you can feel free to give us a call at any of the numbers you see listed here, or you can log on to volusia.org and click on the News tab at the top of the screen to find us. Incidentally, you can find the County Council's meeting calendar there, too. In fact, you can use volusia.org to find out about meeting dates, workshops, topics of interest, activities, and how you can become involved. And we hope you won't forget to listen to Volusia Today. That's Volusia County Government's weekly public radio broadcast. Volusia Today airs every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Sunday mornings on the local radio stations you see on your screen. For Volusia Magazine, I'm Amber Osmond. Have a wonderful evening. <music>